Hello and welcome to The Hated and the Dead with Tom Lehman. The subject of today's episode is probably the least well-known person to have led the Soviet Union. If you don't include Chernenko and Andropov, the two place-holding geriatrics who managed just one year apiece in charge in the 1980s. By contrast, Leonid Brezhnev was the leader of the Soviet Union for 18 years between 1964 and his death in 1982, and despite this, he remains a come-again to many and a mystery to most. He represents the missing link between the Soviet heyday of the early 1960s and its endgame under Mikhail Gorbachev. Brezhnev didn't just preside over the Soviet descent into mediocrity and ultimately the history books, though. In more ways than one, he initiated it. Economic stagnation, corruption, crackdowns on dissidents such as author Alexander Solzhenitsyn, and a costly, mindless war in Afghanistan, each of which occurred under his watch, could all appear on the Soviet epitaph. At least, that was how Mikhail Gorbachev saw it. Since the fall of the Soviet Union, though, some historians have come to see the Brezhnev era more positively. Nuclear control, detente with the West, and steadily rising living standards at home could all be put on Brezhnev's epitaph. As my guest and I discuss today, one person's stagnation is another's stability. They are essentially the same phenomena, merely viewed from different perspectives. My guest is Suzanne Schattenberg, Professor of Contemporary History and Director of the Research Centre for East European Studies at the University of Bremen in Germany. Her book, Brezhnev, Making of a Statesman, was published by Bloomsbury in 2021. We discuss Brezhnev's ascent towards the pinnacle of Soviet power, his questionable commitment to the Bolshevik cause, and whether his cautious approach to leadership has been emulated by other Russian leaders hence, principally Vladimir Putin. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to introduce Leonid Brezhnev. Hi, Suzanne. How are you? Hi. Fine, thanks. How are you? Good, thank you. We're talking about Leonid Brezhnev today, Suzanne. Um, he was the leader of the Soviet Union from 1964 until 1982. He was the first Soviet leader who didn't sort of actively play a part in the October Revolution in 1917. He was only 11 when that happened. He wasn't, though, the first Soviet leader to be born in or near Ukraine, somebody that could claim to be a Ukrainian. Nikita Khrushchev, his predecessor, was born very close to what is modern-day Ukraine. Um, can you talk a bit about what Brezhnev's early life was like in Ukraine? Yes, it was, until the revolution, a quite nice life, it seems like. So there was nothing special, and this is really curious because there was nothing revolutionary in his life. Uh, even his parents were not supporting the Bolsheviks. Um, they were quite normal people, that means workers. Um, both his parents had come from Russia to Ukraine in search for labor. And uh, they met at the factory where his father worked. He was a skilled worker or a member of the so-called uh, working aristocracy. So somebody who made his way up uh, due to education. And that is what they wanted for their son also to move upward uh, through education. And this is quite fascinating and uh, rare that he visited um, a high school, which was normally not affordable for ordinary workers. And um, it seems like he had a pretty nice life in, with swimming in the Dnieper and playing soccer or so football. And his mother wanted to, him to become an engineer, that he could afford a little house and a car. And his father obviously dreamed dreamt of him becoming a diplomat. 
It, it, it's quite an interesting thing about a lot of the people that ended up playing such an important role in the sort of Soviet Politburo bureaucracies that they didn't necessarily fit the sort of classic revolutionaries uh, profile, maybe. Brezhnev obviously decided that, that that is what he wanted to do. What do you think it was? Was there a sort of turning point in his early life? Was there something important that led him on on the road to being a, a sort of fundamentally a figure of of the Bolshevik left? This point came very late, and it seems rather that it was not his decision, but the thir- the circumstances in 19, uh, 1937 only. And I think the, the major turning point, of course, was the revolution and the civil war, which affected uh, quite severely his life and, and ruined everything they had before. So he had to live through hunger, very um, uh, heart diseases by from which he nearly died. And he went to school um, barefoot, so they even couldn't afford uh, shoes. And this is very amazing that to him, revolution meant destruction, ruin, uh, and of the good life he had before. And there was nothing positive about it. He had a, a younger brother. Uh, they fled from their hometown, uh, Kamienskoye, and uh, went to the place his father came from, to, to Kursk. And he had to take up a very similar, uh, a very simple job, just, just working. So even not very proletarian, he worked as a, a packer unloading trucks uh, for four years just to earn his living. And what is really uh, curious and, and uh, striking is that he loved to act. So he joined together um, with his uh, siblings um, uh, an amateur uh, acting group in the early 20s and later when he studied at a, a technical college to become a land surveyor he earned his um, money in, a, in the local theater as an extra um, so this was really uh, what he loved to do, um, acting and having um, a good life. And still in the 1920s, uh, nothing revolutionary, no political um, aims or nowhere. <laughs> That's odd. Yes. Really. <laughs> yes. And it is really due to his um, professional development or jobs he had that he joined um, first the Komsomol, uh, so the youth organization to uh, be able to enroll at the technical college and then join the party when he already uh, became a land surveyor and and had the first uh, responsibilities in the local administration. So it is really late that he finally was accepted at full, as full member of the party in 1931 only. I mean, this uh, period in Soviet history was terrifying. I'm, two of, I think, lived through it was the period of the, of the purges under Joseph Stalin. You mentioned 1937 a minute ago, obviously the purges mo- mostly happening around... Um, that time. For somebody like Brezhnev, a young man, how did people like him sort of attempt to begin moving up the party hierarchy, a party hierarchy that as they were trying to move up, somebody at the top was basically clawing down at them almost constantly? We know that he had to function during the uh, decolacization and it was his task to um, measure the land which was taken by the peasants and give it to the kolkhosis and obviously he was so frightened by the violence he met 
um, which was executed by by the peasants who really tried to defend themselves, uh, that he took flight from from the countryside and uh, went to Moscow in order to uh, begin his studies there, enroll at the um, university, and only to to um, to run again after just uh, two months because uh, Moscow was totally crowded in 1930 by peasants who had fled like him uh, from decolonization and. Uh, this is really amazing because it's one year which in his officially biographies is just cut out and they tell that he uh, left the, the countryside in 31, but, but we know from the sources now that he already left in, in 30. And he then enrolled in his hometown again in Kamienskoye uh, at the, um, at the high, uh, at the university or technical uh, university for um, becoming an engineer. And here again, he had to join the decolonization campaigns. And we have unfortunately no uh, sources telling what he went through in this time. And we know that he functioned through, that he did what he was um, ordered to, to do. But uh, later, uh, he reported that um, in the beginning they believed that it was right to force the peasants into the kolkhosis, but then he understood that they were just taking the last piece of bread from this poor, starving peasants and their children. So it seems like he later... Obviously, from any Russian of Brezhnev's age, the Second World War was a, an immensely important period. Uh, it's still celebrated um, in Russia today with a, a ferocity that I'd say isn't matched by other members of the Allied cause like Britain and France um, because of the nature and level of, of uh, bloodshed that the Soviets under undertook. What was Brezhnev's experience of the Second World War or the, or the Great Patriotic War, as the Russians yeah. call it? Uh, here, I think two things are interesting. The one is that he uh, was a rather regular politcommissar, so without any uh, responsibility in the sense of uh, being a commander or something like that, what uh, his official biographer biographers made of him later, but he was not at all in, in charge of anything, despite, um, yes, uh, talking to the troop and keeping up the courage and preparing them for, for the fight. So all the stories of his um, deeds uh, are really just uh, in invented, or uh, at least just, uh, yes, um, exact, exact, over exaggerated. Uh, but what is really important is that he suffered during the war and, and f uh, he really felt terrified by uh, the violence and the threat the war put to his own life. So in the beginning, he was still in Dnepropetrovsk and he had to evacuate uh, or help to evacuate first uh, the industry and then the people and finally uh, the army. And, and so he, he, he stayed there and also in, in Novorossiysk uh, until uh, the, the very last moment when the German already came into the city. And he, he later told his comrades how frightening that this had been and uh, how much he went uh, through hell. And uh, what we know from what he told all his colleagues and aides and, and uh, persons he met later, this was a very uh, strong uh, motivation for him to, um, to avoid a third world war. So when he became general secretary, uh, this was obviously uh, their motivation to get into negotiations with the West and, and try 
to to come to a better peace. Uh, so so performance. so it was it was quite a, a traumatic uh, event for him then. Yes. Yeah. It was absolutely traumatic, and although it is said for Khrushchev, um, who was uh, maybe even more involved into fighting and and at the at the front, uh, who uh, after the war never wanted to see movies on the war again. Uh, Brezhnev loved these kind of movies, but he he always was touched to tears. So. Um, he was really sensible uh, about this, uh, the, the topic of, of the war. If we, if we think about Khrushchev as a, as a kind of leader of the Soviet Union, moving forward a bit. St Joseph Stalin died in 1953. He'd obviously been this, you know, all-encompassing leader who sort of consumed every element of public and, and private life within the Soviet Union. Khrushchev eventually succeeded him in the sort of early, mid-1950s. Can you put into a bit of context of what Khrushchev tried to do during the 1950s before we go on to talk about Brezhnev's leadership? Um, yes, uh, so Khrushchev... Um uh, and at the terror, it was not only him, of course, but the whole Politburo, which was then called already Presidium of the party, uh, they decided to end the terror, to dissolve the Gulag, uh, to end torture, and to reinstall something like what they called uh, socialist, the rule of, of socialist law. So they had uh, huge amnesties of, of prisoners of the Gulag and of course most famous the 1956 so-called secret speech by Khrushchev uh, where he accused uh, Stalin of uh, all the crimes he had uh, committed although we have to say that he somehow divided Stalin into a, a good one before 34 and a bad one after 35. So uh, what he um, called as crime was a great terror against the party and the army, uh, not yet against the, the, the vast majority of, of uh, the population and all the ethnicities, and of course um, the failure during the war and, and uh, Stalin's cult of personality. Um, so, but uh, the, the, the beginning of the 1930s, so the decollectivization uh, de and collectivation uh, of uh, the countryside, they were still a taboo and, and not um, object of uh, accusation. So Khrushchev opened the society and uh, like the uh, poet uh, Andrei Beethoven said, he brought back laughter to, to the Soviet people. How do you think Brezhnev felt about that instinctively? <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question, but because we really we have no sources on this. Uh, my impression is from what he did that he supported it uh, very much, and um, he he really yearned for a, a better living. So maybe he even uh, did not so much long for reform on an intellectual or political level than on a socio-economic level. He, he's, he had seen uh, the people suffering not only during the war, but also after the war when he was party leader in Ukraine, in uh, Moldavia and in, in Kazakhstan. So he, he was really tired of um, having the people to say, just try harder, but we have no nothing for you, no money, no material, no machines, no food, uh, just try as hard as you can. And now with Khrushchev, um, the provinces, the republics had the right to, to ask for resources. And that is what Brezhnev used and, and what he obviously uh, liked very much uh, about 
um, Khrushchev. And so I think in his mind was very much this better living, the idea of a better living for, for everybody. Khrushchev came under increasing pressure from about 1962 onwards. By this point, Brezhnev was 56. He was a fairly senior figure within the Bolshevik party by that stage. Um, where do you think that pressure was coming from against Khrushchev? So Khrushchev, <laughs> to understand Khrushchev, you have to see him, how he is speaking, even if you don't understand Russian. But he is so, um, do you say that, ex extroverted? He's so mm -hmm. vivid, yeah. uh, so hot-tempered. Uh, he really had always problems in keeping to the text of his speeches. He loved to improvise. And that was really a nightmare to his advisors because he, he got into rage and he started shouting at everybody. And that is how he made himself a lot of fools. And he did not care anymore about those who would support him, which is quite amazing at first glance, because in 1957, he barely uh, survived a coup against him. And he uh, survived only because all the uh, regional party leaders from the regions and republics had supported him. And suddenly he began to to, to get rid of them, to replace them without asking them and just to damage their uh, their career. And, and not only he, he damaged their career, he also called them bad names. He really loved to make fun of them. And uh, so, so in the early 1960s, there was nearly nobody left who still supported Khrushchev or liked him or really dared to to tell him openly what the situation was about. And this is also true for, for Brezhnev, who was at the beginning really um, something like a client or, um, um, yeah, uh, uh, oh, I don't know if you say, say pupil or uh, a follower of Khrushchev and who made his career uh, thanks to Khrushchev, who acted as, as his patron. And he also was given by Khrushchev the office, Brezhnev like most, the uh, president of the Soviet Union, that is the, um, the, the president of the, um, of the Supreme uh, S Soviet. And uh, nevertheless, um, also Brezhnev started f uh, fearing Khrushchev and his uh, outbreaks and uh, all his reforms, um, which, with which he not only uh, divided all the ministries uh, for having local economic Soviets, uh, but also he called for reform of the presidium. And, and uh, in summer 64, he said after the return from his holiday, he would also dissolve the presidium, which was to him a bunch of old men. And so the, the people in the inner circle, they had to fear for their own uh, career and, and decided to end this. Indeed, and uh, yes, uh, Khrushchev was was sort of ousted from power in I think October of sixty four. Um, yes. How was it that of the sort of runners and riders that were in place to potentially succeed Nikita Khrushchev? Why was it ultimately Brezhnev, a figure who you've painted so far as not really uh, being particularly committal in terms of the policies? that he chose, probably not very ideological. Why Brezhnev? Yeah, that's a good question because there are some people um, of his or his rivals later said he um, became general secretary by incident and stated by accident in, in this office. <laughs> and 
So uh, I think this was uh, probably his his best um, ability to to appear as a nice guy who was not threatening anybody and uh, who gave the impression that y you could handle him. So he was underestimated as a power player and he is really said to be a virtuoso of, of power games because yeah, he was just, just a nice man and uh, his friends and foes both later said that he was good in listening, in being patient and caring about everybody. He was polite. Uh, he even um, could uh, admit that he did not know everything, that he did not dread uh, Lenin and had no idea of ideology. And um, I think, and not only me, so most of his... Um, Followers said that after Stalin, uh, who brought death and terror, and after Khrushchev, who brought reforms, but also kind of, of fury and um, uncertainty, the, the people and uh, mostly the party was longing for somebody who was had a had a. Um, good temper and and was not extroverted uh, somebody who who would bring uh, peace and normal times to to the people and to to the soviet union that was supposed to be his, his flaws where in reality his his forces and and um what he could rely on well this is what i want to spend the rest of the interview talking about really is this this um notion of stability i think that's that he, he was seen as a, as a sort of stable bureaucrat in yes. the 1960s when he took over um just to be a bit more specific around this time obviously the soviet union was one of the two world superpowers at the time so there's both the domestic element to to this country and a, and a very important international one Starting with the international side of things, um, what did Brezhnev want to do in terms of making the Soviet Union more stable, sort of internationally, uh, as an actor on the world stage, such as it was? Yeah. So his aim was to to come close to the United States. So uh, as one of the two superpowers the, to get into contact, direct contact with the US president was his first aim. Uh, also in terms of um, being accepted as an equal. And uh, so the, the US president, of course, was to him the, the central figure to negotiate negotiate about arm limitation, about detente, uh, economic cooperation, etc. And uh, he had obviously a quite clear plan uh, how to address um, the, the US president or how to make his way to him through uh, the West German Chancellor and, and the French president. He obviously thought that both would help him to um, yeah, get closer to the U.S. president. So what is special about Brezhnev is that in, in contrast to his predecessor, Khrushchev, who liked to display himself as a peasant or as a proletarian and try to boycott all the rules of how to dress and how to behave uh, on the international level, Brezhnev adored to to stage the Western politician. He he loved to dress well, and uh, he was good looking at that time. Um, and he he also loved to, to behave like a Western statesman. So the first time when he uh, met R Richard Nixon, who had been to Moscow in 1957 as uh, vice president. The first time, uh, the first thing Brezhnev made sure to to um, to say to Nixon was, uh, "You remember the talk in the kitchen and how uh, Khrushchev 
um, was shouting at you, please, let's forget about this. I'm totally different. And, and that is what he expressed during all the time or during the good years until 1975. He tried to make clear that he was not an ideologue, that uh, party ideology had uh, no place in foreign policy, uh, that he was a pragmatic uh, politician who tried to come close to the Western statesmen on a very personal level and, and to say uh, in, in four eyes talks, look, I am like you and we both want peace. So what is there which could uh, disturb us or hinder us from doing so? I think at least in, in the sort of first half of his rule, you mentioned arms control and obviously this was off the back of the Cuban Missile Crisis which had happened under Khrushchev. Um, I think in terms of arms control, you'd have to say he was reasonably successful at dealing with the Americans on that front, right? Yes, yes. So, uh, of course, it was not only that he tried to get a personal relationship with his uh, man, but uh, he he had a clear um, agenda, and that was, uh, on the one hand, the... Uh, um, strategic arms limitation talks uh, so and the first treaty on it, which he signed with Richard Nixon in 72 in, in Moscow. Uh, but also um, he and, and the Soviet Union, uh, they were the initiators of uh, the um, conference on security and cooperation in, in Europe, which is today the organization for security and cooperation in, in Europe. So this also was negotiated um, from 1972 to 75 and then signed in, in Helsinki. And these were uh, two major contracts which really had the at least potential to, to make the world uh, different and, and more uh, peaceful. And so he was really um, successful, uh, at least with his two, two treaties. Yeah. I think domestically, though, there's always a notion of what is described as stagnation with Brezhnev. Yeah. It's become a, it, it's actually got, bears his name, the, the period in his, the, the Brezhnev stagnation. Um, can you go into what that entailed in rough terms? Yes. I mean, first, it's important to know that it was Gorbachev who said, um, who, who um, gave the period this name um, already post factum, so only after it. Mm. And, uh, but he, he was not wrong about it because in the end it was really stagnation. Nothing moved uh, politically and uh, in, uh, econo economically. But in, in the beginning it was really this uh, positive uh, notion of uh, stability. Uh, Brezhnev um, convinced, uh, uh, introduced in, in, in society and uh, economy. He cared about that the um, apartment building programs continued, that um, wages were rising, that pensions were rising, that people uh, could afford a car. He, he uh, had this uh, huge deal um, with uh, the automobile company uh, Fiat to, to build this uh, car factory. Uh, in Togliati on, on the Volga. So he really cared about the good life of, of simple uh, persons. Uh, on the other hand, he has had a huge rivalry with the prime minister or the, uh, the, the um, chairman of, of the Soviet of uh, ministers, Kosygin. And Kosygin, who gave, is the one who gave uh, the great economic reforms of the year 65 is named. So they tried to reform economy and to have more autonomy for the directors of the factory uh, to, um, to, to trigger the interesting interestedness, how they called it, of the workers uh, in, in earning more 
more money and so a, uh, a sort of incentive program yes, then. Uh, incentives so right it, it, a, yeah. a kind of um i heard kosigan described as a sort of gorbachev before gorbachev uh yes <laughs> yes or a kind of new economic reforms which yeah. were already in the 1920s uh, under lenin and but the the reforms they did bring some result but of course they did not change the 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 major uh, the the system where resources uh, were still allocated from the center and where prices were still uh, dictated and uh, the factories still had to obey to the plants and there was not much f for a place for reform or to um, just for, for invention and, and get better uh, products. So this is also a, a major uh, f failure that um, instead of reforming economy, um, Brezhnev and Kosygin uh, took uh, their gold and bought all kind of goods in the West. So not only wheat and, and meat, but also uh, sweaters and uh, clothes, shoes, whatever the people wanted. And even more when they had revolutionary um, uh, anniversaries. So for uh, 7th November, the day of October Revolution or 1st May, Labor Day, uh, they they went shopping, so to say, in the West to, uh, <laughs> to uh, prove to the people how well they were living, although these were all Western goods or from the Central uh, European countries. It, it sounds quite a lot like what the West does with China now. <laughs> Just going abroad and, and, you know, importing all sorts of cheap Yes, but we don't pretend that them. it is Western goods. We we know it's from China. <laughs> well, sure, yeah. I, mean, I want to sort of go into to why Brezhnev was doing this. You've mentioned sort of, um, you know, that he that he cared deeply about raising social standards, raising the standard of living. Um, but none of this is is what you could sort of describe as as, as communist or as ideological, really. Um, was he essentially just a, a a sort of basically a bureaucrat? Do you think? Do you think he ever really believed in the sort of founding principles of the Bolshevik Party, or was he just basically he saw a ladder and wanted to climb it? That is a really difficult question because we have nothing written from him uh, on the question whether he believed in, in socialism, communism, or whatever. But we know he, he did not really read the ideology. He did not really care. Um, I think it was not that he was interested in the career. He, he later said that the best job he ever had was that of an oblast manager so the, the the leader of a major region where he could uh, chat with the people care about the people so he was really a manager somebody who was good in in doing and fixing things he was not a really a real politician in in that way he had no visions or greater aims he just wanted a good life for for everybody and um but on the other hand, of course, he was aware that he was a superpower and uh, that he had to defend the Soviet Union as the better system. And I, I think he still believed that the Soviet Union was a better uh, societal and economic and thus also political system. But maybe or certainly not so much because he uh, compared the two system, but rather because um, this he was not able to to question this. So this was reality to him. We have the better system, dot, uh, and that's it. And it, so it's it's not so much he was a communist, but he was a, a Soviet leader, not a communist leader. 
he was in power for a very long time. He was in power for 18 years. But quite a lot of that, well, for all of that, he was he was quite old, um, and especially towards the end. I mean, it, he, he became quite ill yes. from sort of the mid to late 70s onwards. He died in 1982. Do you think that as he became iller, more ill, it, it's fair to say that he sort of lost control of of policy making that he lost control of these plates that he'd been trying to spin quite you know tenaciously yes yes absolutely and um i mean he became ill that means he he became pill addicted this is also very important because in in the west all the secret services try to find out what was wrong with him and the the french Secret Service even uh, tried to to um, how to say to to get uh, hold on what was in his toilet when he stayed in Paris and, and to right. analyze uh, the contents and they yes they realized that he was uh, ill but they could not say what it was probably they were just not looking for for all the um, sleeping pills and and. Uh, um, and tranquilizers he he was uh, misusing uh, and um, what is also really interesting in political terms that he he from seventy five when he became really addicted and not really able to uh, fulfill his task of of leading this huge country the system try. Uh, kept on working and the Politburo members uh, convinced him to stay in office, although twice he allegedly said he would resign. So the system he had built up worked even with, without him uh, and it, it functioned, although of course the results were quite catastrophic. But the Politburo members, who were all his, the same generation and as, as old and as ill as he was, of course, um, they were rather uh, um, willing to live on with this uh, situation and pretend he was still uh, capable and pretend he was attending the Congress while he was not, uh, than to... Um, choose a successor because they all were frightened what was what kind of power struggle would begin i i think probably the sort of best example of him losing control here well or perhaps losing control that's sort of what i want to ask you is this disastrous invasion of afghanistan in 1979 um it, do you think that Brezhnev was really in control of what he was doing here? Do you think uh, how much blame do you, can you lay at the door reasonably of, of Brezhnev in terms of do you think he actually made a bad decision or do you think that he he just he he, had, he didn't really make this decision that he was completely out of the picture by this stage? Yeah. So um, the the Politburo uh, put up. A, commission for Afghanistan and he was not on this board so uh, formally you could say he was not on the board he was not involved so it's not his fault but on the other hand you can of course say he was still the general secretary and he uh, should have been able to be on the board or even to uh, argue with the board and when they, they told him that they had taken the decision he had had to uh, um, struggle with them. So uh, th this is a little bit complicated because on the one hand, we know he was not on this decisive board. There was only uh, the, the um, Minister of Defense, Ustinov, Andropov as KGB chef and uh, Gromyko as foreign minister. Um, but on the other hand, from published sources, we now uh, we know that he was uh, attending the Politburo session when all this was discussed. And so before we thought he was absent and somehow at his dacha or in a rehab or wherever, 
Um, but, but he was in the Kremlin when they were discussing this. So still he has, of course, uh, to be blamed. And But was this really um, a disaster or um, striking is that everything what happened after the invasion, so the, the, the international isolation, the total damage of the prestige of the Soviet Union, also in the so-called third world, um, the end of all attempts for detente, the signing of uh, SOL II, so the endorsement by uh, the um, U.S. Uh, Congress uh, that was then just ruined, and um, the, the boycott of uh, the Olympic Games in summer 1980. So everything of this had been foreseen by the Politburo. They had discussed it before. So they knew what would come. And nevertheless, they, when they were informed that allegedly the Afghanistan uh, leadership was contacting the CIA and switching sides, begging for support from the U.S. and not anymore from the Soviet, they felt they had to invade. And they were totally mistaken by, mistaken by uh, the judgment of the situation because obviously they thought it would be like in Prague, go in, change the leader, go out. And it was a disaster. I mean, this episode completely undid all of the the sort of stabilising of the international situation, making the Soviet Union a more sort of rational, uh, dependable partner in the world. This this completely torpedoed all of that. Um, if you look at the Soviet the Soviet Union by 1980, let's say the, the sort of late late Brezhnev era, you've got serious economic stagnation. Um, by any measurement, the Russian measurement or the Western measurement, you've got a sort of political ossification where there's nobody sort of under the age of 70 anywhere near power. And you've now got this intractable war, which has, has you know, completely pilloried the Soviet reputation, a bit like the war in Ukraine is doing now. Yeah. Um, do you think that the Brezhnev era was a decisive turning point in the Soviet Union. That's to say, by 1980, 81, 82, when the situation was really awful compared to what it had been when Brezhnev took over. Um, do you think another leader or another type of leadership could have led the country more, through, more successfully through this period? Or do you think that the problems that the Soviet Union experienced were essentially structural and endemic. These weren't things that you can really attribute to Brezhnev, that they were going to go through them anyway. Yeah, uh, that is an interesting question. Um, um, uh, how to answer? I think that it might um, have the, 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 there might have been a chance to to lead this country into a different era um, we see in China, right? So they, they stayed formally, at least with socialism, uh, but reformed the economy uh, totally. So this is, of course, an example that principally it is possible to uh, um, save power for the one and only party, but uh, give uh, yeah freedom of action to to the economy, and um, probably the, there was such a chance uh, for for the Soviet Union, um, but but uh, nobody who who dared to to do so. And I think even with Kosygin, um, maybe the um, economy would have performed better, but uh, the structural problems uh, would have remained. So the allocation of resources, the price uh, definition, um, no incentives for workers, for for the leaders, uh, etc. So, but in in within the framework of the Soviet Union and the structure, I think Brezhnev was at least a better leader than those from the KGB, which pretended to follow Khrushchev, like uh, Shelepin or Semichastny, 
uh, or, or even the chief ideologue uh, Suslov, um, because they were uh, missing this, yes, human idea of a better life and live, let the people just live in, in peace. Well, this is the thing, I think, because the, the two, there are two sort of buzzwords that we've used a lot today, stability and stagnation. One is seen as positive, the other is seen as negative. But they are basically the same thing. They're just yeah, fr viewed right. <laughs> from a different perspective. And that's what I think is really interesting here, because I'll, you, you, know, you could say that Brezhnev led the Soviet Union you know, through its middle age. The Soviet Union lasted about as long as a, as a human lifespan. And, and he right. oversaw the sort of later period, the transition into mid, into old age when everything starts to go wrong um, and that that was inevitable. But you could also see that he stabilized the system. Um, and perhaps without somebody like Brezhnev, the Soviet Union might not have lasted as long as it did and that it would have just gone into this tailspin. Yes. Do you think that's possible? That it would have collapsed earlier. Uh, I don't think so. I maybe maybe with a radical reformer, somebody like Dubček, um, but I think the real alternative to Brezhnev at that point would have been somebody more like Stalin, uh, who would uh, use the gun, would have used the gun t terror and and reestablished the camps, etc. So I think. Um, of course, we did not talk about the dissidents and and that there were. Uh, camps and and prisons for political uh, prisoners under Brezhnev, but that was nothing compared to to the Stalin uh, time. And I think what is really important here is that he shaped the idea of a good living under socialism. So um, this was really the, the 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 golden age. I mean, we have to be careful with his terms, but that is how the Soviet Union is now remembered. I mean, of course, much too positive, but but there is um, a, a, a core, a seed of of uh, um, a reality in it that really the the better years and and when the it's people live more or less well and the Soviet Union was a, an acknowledged uh, superpower that were really um, the, the Brezhnev uh, years. And also very interestingly, although Brezhnev ruined in 19, with, with the invasion of Afghanistan in the early 90, 80s, he ruined everything he had begun with his detente. Nevertheless, uh, the treaties uh, stayed uh, intact and, 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 and worked. So, I mean, the, the OECD is still working uh, today and uh, the, the Helsinki Treaty was really crucial for the dissident movement to develop in, in the whole of East and Central Europe. So, of course, it was not his intention, uh, but uh, it was uh, um, to to huge um, extent uh, his um, success that the dissidents became so so powerful and and eventually uh, um, were successful in 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 uh, ruining the system and and um, leading it to to freedom and d democracy. Something which remarkably happened only ten years after Brezhnev died. It seems amazing that there's only a decade between. Brezhnev's death and the end of the Soviet Union, the transition to, uh, well, maybe not democracy, but but to sort of post post communism. Anyway, I, yes. I think um, over the so probably not so much recently because of of what's been going on in Ukraine, because that sort of upset the apple cart so much with with Vladimir Putin's uh, time in charge of Russia. But I have b before read the term or the adjective Brezhnevite ascribed to some post-Soviet leaders, including Vladimir Putin and Alexander Lukashenko and other people within the Central Asian countries, this, this idea of continuity. 
Do you think Brezhnev? Do you think Brezhnev's type of leadership has sort of become a, a a policy type and a source of inspiration for people since? I mean, if you think about you know the medals and the sort of fundamentally cautious approach to leadership that people like Putin were were quite famous for deploying. Do you think this is a Do you think this is a type? That is hard to say. Uh, maybe yes. I think it's something like a model. And and for those dictators or semi-dictators, a rather positive model they would like to to follow. Um, I, as a Brezhnev biographer, of course, have to defend Brezhnev and say that they are totally different. <laughs> uh, How though? How do you um, think they are different? I I mean in the sense that um, Brezhnev wanted to to uh, have a permanent peace with the USA. And uh, so his aim was really to uh, get closer to, to the West and to the USA. And he was am admiring in a certain and special way the West. And I think he, um, yes, he, he would be terrified if he saw now what Putin is, how he is behaving and trying to isolate its country from from the West and blame everything on on the USA. I think in a, in a different way, of course, it's correct that Putin is behaving like Brezhnev, or at least tried to. That is, on the one hand, uh, uh, guarantee a, a good or on a lower level, good uh, living standard to, to the people, but deny them political rights and uh, arrest those who who uh, do not obey and, and try to speak up. So here we have, of course, a, a certain uh, similarity um, between the two. And just as a final question, in t that idea of... of locking in a certain degree of kind of steady economic growth, replicable economic growth, without the, the political freedoms to go with it. Do you think that Brezhnev's time... Well, Brezhnev's time does show that it's unsustainable. Um, do you think it's un unsustainable always? Having economic freedom but not political freedom, do you think that it's, it, it's inherently unstable? in some way, and that it will always eventually fail? Uh, I think that is really difficult to, to say, but um, regarding Russia, uh, I don't think it's, it's really uh, economic um, f freedom, right? Uh, because we have no economic development at all if we look at it closer. So like uh, in Soviet time, Russia is still relying uh, uh, on the export of resources, mainly energy, so gas and oil, but also uh, timber and uh, uh, other natural resources. So uh, since the breakdown of the Soviet Union in 1991, we don't see uh, any major or important development of, of own um, industry. And that is really um, a, a huge problem. Uh, Russia will find out at least now uh, when it's denied um, the import of all the goods they, came, they got before from the West, uh, computers, uh, machinery, uh, all kind of... Um, instruments, uh, etc. So th th there's still a lot of innovation missing and, and somehow we still have the old structure problem, um, which is uh, already attested for the early 1970s when in the Western industrialized countries, um, we have a second industrial revolution and the um, recline of heavy industry and the beginning of computer industry and uh, the Soviet Union had so much resources and, and uh, 
uh, oil and gas that they missed this um, reform because there was no pressure for it. And, and still it's uh, living in this uh, plenty of, of energy resources and, and has no technical development. So, uh, and I have no idea where it will lead to, but uh, yeah, it's not sustainable. <laughs> it, it certainly doesn't look like it's going to lead anywhere good yeah. at the moment. I, Suzanne, thank you very much. That was that was great. I really enjoyed that. Uh, if if people want to discuss uh, or, or read about these these topics a bit more, uh, what can you direct them towards? Uh, of course, to my book. <laughs> and um, yes, maybe I should apologize because a lot of things have not been uh, mentioned uh, here, but at least we talked about the, the distance. I don't want to uh, greenwash uh, Brezhnev, uh, but uh, of course I highlighted the more positive um things of uh, or sides of his personality um here yeah yeah thank you suzanne you're welcome thank you thank you for listening to the hated and the dead if you've enjoyed this podcast follow it on spotify and apple podcasts and for good measure leave us a review you can also follow the hated and the dead on twitter instagram and facebook so you never miss new content